Welcome. Y'all go ahead and stand up. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Joy to the nations when Jesus is King. Let's sing that again. Sing to the King. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Life and salvation. Joy to the nations when Jesus is King. So come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He is all we need. He is all we need. We lift up a heart. Jesus, sing to the King. this battle and we know that our king is returning amen and we're waiting and we're gonna be ready are you ready let's sing it again for his return we watch and we pray and we
Here I am before you, falling in love and seeking your truth, knowing that your perfect grace has brought me to this place. Because of you, I freely live my life to you. Amen? Amen. Boy, I wish I could sing. Because that would be the song that I'd sing every day, every minute of my life. Amen. From the rooftops that I am his. Well, I want to welcome you to Believer's Fellowship this morning. Uh, thank you for being here. It is a light crowd uh, with, with Thanksgiving. Pray for those that are traveling. Pray for those that are not feeling well. And I pray for those that have said, you know, it's the Sunday after Thanksgiving. I'm not going to church. Praying for them as well. 
Um, I want to thank you again for being here. First time visitors, there's a welcome card and a seat back in front of you. I'd ask that you fill that out at the end of the service. We'd love the opportunity to meet you, greet you, put a, pre, put a free gift in your hand. For those joining us online, uh, there's a, you go to our website, bfchurch.com. There's a guest tab from there. Click, complete that short survey. We'll be sure to get in contact with you. Uh, for our first time visitors, if you leave us your email address, we will email you a letter uh, from our senior pastor, just thanking you for being here uh, on top of that. So, uh, but again, after service, we'd love the opportunity to meet you. But what we want to do right now is for our members to get to know you. So uh, let's all stand up and greet those that are beside each other, beside you. Amen, amen, amen. If you could return to your seats and go ahead and have a seat. Return to your seats and go ahead and have a seat. We're going to do things a little different. We're going to do some announcements, so go ahead and have a seat. Um, first announcement here is, of course, don't forget to stay connected with us. Oh, I'm sorry, family night is tonight. Family night is tonight, so no evening activities, no youth, no lift, no awanas. Uh, don't forget our Wednesday night Bible study, Ephesians. Uh, this is a little different than we've done our previous Bible studies. It is a joint Bible study. So our, usually, typically, we have our men's Bible study and the women's Bible study. This one, we decided to put everybody, so we're all together. We're just going through God's Word together. And what's great about it is that I'm not teaching it. Y'all, the people that are there on Wednesday night are teaching it to each other. So we, we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and there's three questions that are asked. What's going on in the world at the time of, of that when Paul is writing this letter? What is the theology behind Scripture? What does Scripture say who God is? And then what is God's call for us? What is Paul telling us to do in, these, in this Scripture? And so again, we go verse by verse, chapter by, by chapter. And so this week is chapter 4. And we will dedicate the entire time through chapter 4. So you don't want to miss that. Um, and then don't forget our kids lock in December 2nd. Uh, you could, it's $10 in advance, $15 at the door. And so it's December 2nd through the 3rd. And there you see the information behind me. Our women's ministry event is December 9th. Don't forget to bring a wrapped ornament, a wrapped ornament to, to do the ornament exchange. Uh, and the guest speaker is Rita. She's going to give an update on her ministry. She's uh, one of our missionaries in Africa. And so you don't want to miss that, ladies, for that uh, women's winter get-together. Uh, and that is here at the church. And then our youth event is December 10th. Uh, our youth will be here. Uh, it's, all, it's an all-day thing. And uh, it's from 1 to 9. We're, we're going to meet here, have a time of, of worship, have a time of, of a lesson. And then we're going to travel to Madisonville to see the Pathway of Lights. Went to it last year with the Jaquettes. And I tell you what, it is, it's a phenomenal experience for our youth uh, where they just walk through um, the, the, just the life of Jesus of that Passion Week. And so you don't want to miss that through the life of Jesus. I apologize. So you don't want to miss that. Uh, December 10th. And don't forget our Christmas service and our New Year's Day service. We're not going to have a Christmas Eve service because Christmas this year is on Christmas Day and it's on Sunday. I apologize. It's on Sunday. 
And so what greater way to celebrate the birth of our, our Savior than to come to church on his birthday? And, and so it, it'd be here at 1045. Bring your family, bring your friends, bring your neighbors. It's not a Sunday that you want to miss. It's a Sunday that you want to be here so that we can honor the King. Amen. And so then again, our the following Sunday is uh, New Year's. So that's January 1st. What better way to start out the new year than to be in church? A time of prayer, a time of just dedicating or rededicating your life to Christ and giving the year to God. And so you want to be here for that, both those Sundays, the 25th and the 1st. And so those are the announcements. We'll have a little bit more at the end, but I wanted to get those out of, uh, get those completed. And so now if you'll stand as we continue worship. stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you working even when i don't feel it you working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't see it you working even when i don't feel it you working you never stop you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Yes, you are way 
be seated. So this morning, we're going to answer the question, what are you thankful for? And so last week, we had our, our um, Thanksgiving Day luncheon, and Miss Angela did a great job on her team. And, and again, kudos to Angela Esty and her team of putting on just a great uh, fellowship and, and lunch. So thank you so much to them. And I'll be mentioning them throughout uh, today's message. Um, but she did something that was unique. She did something. She put a tree at the end wall over here, and she had uh, leaves and butterflies around the tables, and she asked people to write down what they're thankful for. And so I thought it'd be great for us to read, or for me to read and you to listen and hear what people are thankful for. And so I do want to make mention that um, there are a lot of things that a lot of people are thankful for and being thankful for something and being sensitive and, and, and open and raw enough to put it on the tree. I just think that shows first our faith in Christ. 
and, and where we've gone and how people have, have matured in their walk in Christ and how people are continuing to mature in Christ, but re recognizing and realizing that we can be thankful for things that we have and, think so, and, and more, more importantly, thankful for the things that we don't have. Um, because if, if we truly think about it, um, I'm thankful that I'm not destined to go to hell. I'm thankful that I have a savior and, and that I came to know him as my Lord and savior. And, and so let, let me read some of these out. This, and there's no names attached to these, but it said, blessed with a wonderful God, loving husband, I love him so much. This one says, I'm thankful for God. God is the best. And then again, it says, God is the best. This one said, God's provision. Freedom, family, my sins forgiven, Jesus loves. I am thankful for all that I have and don't have. God, family, church family, job, coworkers, friends. This one says, I'm thankful for Texas, right there. God, thank you for your faithfulness in all things. This one says, Mr. Sam would like to thank Megan for taking care of him every day. Sam, it is a blessing to have you back, brother. Know that we've been missing you too, brother. I'm thankful for my family. I am thankful for God giving my baby girl, Bella, back to me and my family for his blessing to give me the strength to save her life. I am thankful for God. And lastly, I'm so very thankful for my church, my amazing church family. That's a lot to be thankful for, you know, and, and, and that wasn't all of them. There's still many up there. And so if you have an opportunity to go to our fellowship hall, they're still on the wall. Um, but there's so much to be thankful for. And, and now that Thanksgiving is over, have we, have we forgotten about the season of Thanksgiving and, and what means to be thankful? And that should be in our hearts and in, and in what we do every day. And that kind of gets me to today's scripture. You know, when we read 1 Thessalonians, when you read 1 Thessalonians 1 through 4, it's the greeting, it's the opening of the letter. And Paul did this to every letter that he wrote to the church. Usually it was, I, Paul, a servant. I, Paul, a bond servant. I, Paul, a slave to Christ. That's how he would open these letters. But when he opened 1 Thessalonians, he opened it a little bit differently. And he opened it in Thanksgiving. And a lot of times we forget the openings of letters. The openings of letters are kind of like the begots. Everybody knows the begots, right? You know, I, uh, Abraham begot this person, begot this person, begot this person, begot this person. How many of y'all have actually read the begots? Exactly. Because we just kind of glance over the begots to get to the good stuff, right? Well, kind of the same thing with the opening of this letter. We forget the first four verses of Paul's letter because it's just the opening. But this is the meat of the message. This is where he's giving thanks for the, the members of, of the church in Thessalonica, the saints, the servants, and also those that worked with him in ministry. And so we're gonna break this, this, these four verses down and just really think about what you're thankful for. Because for me, the first thing I think about when I'm thankful for is, is Jesus. I would say one of the greatest blessings of being in Christ is the fellowship that comes with salvation. Think about that. But with, with, if, when I was, before I was saved, I had friends. But now that I'm saved and I'm in a body of believers, y'all are my family. And I, I honestly cannot see me doing life without you. I've been in, in, at Believer's Fellowship since I was saved. So I got saved in 2004. This is the only church I know. And so I, I, I am biased in that. But this is the best church on earth. And not just because I'm here, although that's part of it. it it's because this church led me to Christ. These, the pastors here spoke biblical truth into me. There were men and women that mentored me so that I could stand before you as a, as a continually maturing Christian. See, before Christ, I had friends. 
But now that I'm in Christ, I have a family of believers that lift me up, that are with me thick and thin. I have brothers in the Lord that I could call. You know, everybody's got to have that 3 a.m. brother, that person that they could call at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's not, why are you calling me? But it's, what do you need? We should each have brothers and sisters in the Lord like that. And if you don't, it's not because they're not there, because you're not opening yourself up to be a part of the body of believers. You see, for us that are saved by grace, we belong to the body of Christ and and become part of a church body. When you become a part of of the church, right, the global church, because that's God's family, We are then called to be a part of a local body of believers, a local church. Mr. Bill, if you could do me a favor, can you turn the air down? It's a little warm up here. Thank you. Um, And that church body here is Believer's Fellowship. That's another thing that I'm thankful for. And this morning text comes from the greeting Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church. You see, Paul was led by the Spirit from, from Macedonia to Philippi and then from there to Thessalonica. It's estimated that there were 200,000 people in Thessalonica between Jews and Greeks. Now, these Greeks that were there, they were being so oppressed and really being just weary of Greek paganism because the paganism that was there promoted immorality and indulgence. It's a lot like today. I fear, I fear our country and our, and, our, and our world is being inundated with immorality and indulgences. Just like Thessalonica then, the U.S. and at a broader scale, the world is ripe for the gospel. And although Paul faced a lot of opposition, he developed a love and devotion for the church there. And as we read through this passage, I hope it increases your appreciation for and commitment to the church. You see, when Paul wrote his letter, Paul wrote of a lasting relationship. He says in verse 1, 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. Paul mentioned a lot of relationships associated with the church. He mentioned the servants. When Paul wrote this letter, he included Silas and Timothy in his greeting to the church. Now, the church was familiar with both Silas and Timothy. They were there at the, at the startup of the church there in Thessalonica. And, and so they knew of them. They worked alongside Paul in building up the church. You see, what Paul would do in his journeys, he would go and, and, and as he traveled, he had three missionary trips. And as he traveled on each missionary trip, he would establish a church. And then as people got saved, he would look at, at, at the men there and say, okay, now you're pastor, okay, you're an elder, okay, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. There was no uh, seminary, there wasn't like you know, some, some process of, of, of you have to be a member for so long. It was, hey, we're all new, but God is telling me you're going to be the pastor, and so you're the pastor. And so they would build these churches up, and then they would leave, and then go on to the next, next town and to the next city to establish another church. And so the church body there in Thessalonica was familiar with these three men. And he knew that the church would be thankful for them as they are for, were for each other. You see, there's something special about working and doing ministry together, amen? I'm sure we can all speak of it because I look around the crowd. There's not one person here that is not involved in ministry. From working in the pantries. There's a bond that forms working upstairs, amen? That's where you minister to each other. That's where you pray for each other, pray with each other. There's a bond that's formed there. Think of lift groups. Lift groups is our small group uh, uh, ministry. It's called Living in Fellowship Together. That's where you really make your connection. Yes, we have the, the church here we meet on Sunday, but then our lift groups are smaller setting. That's where you really make your connection. That's where you establish, you know, that's where you establish that family environment where you break bread together, where you pray for each other, where you learn God's word deep, you get into God's word deeper there. You think of our mission trips. There's a lot, there's a lot of camaraderie when it comes to mission trips because you are with those people for 
seven, ten days. And yes, I, listen, when we went to uh, that country in the Caribbean uh, not too long ago, there was a brother there that I was ready to throw in the ocean. But we, we persevered, and praise God, I persevered. Um, but there was a camaraderie there. There's a fellowship there. Yes, he's spiritual sandpaper to me, but God placed him there for me, for, for him to, 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 you know, to, to kind of rough, uh, or smooth out those rough edges in my life. And so there's that bond that's formed there. You think about all the, the, the natural disasters that have happened to this campus. Right. Um, I remember when I, we first started, first, first started coming early on, there was a hurricane and there was three feet of water in this entire sanctuary. Three feet of water, snakes swimming in here, all kinds of stuff. And then we had Harvey. Right. Remember that Harvey um, church upstairs. Remember, remember that where we had to we had to say, OK, you can come this Sunday. But you, you can't come next Sunday. We had to alternate when people could come because we had limited seating upstairs. And then we had that water heater back here that, that uh, leaked. And so we had water all the way out here. And it wasn't nothing but a call for me to get 10 guys out here with, with shop vacs and we washed, you know, vacuumed all the water out. But in each of those areas, either replacing tile, uh, carpet tiles, painting, or vacuuming water out of here, there's a camaraderie. There's, there's a fellowship there that takes place. There's a bond there. Because we're all doing ministry together. You think about decorating for events last, last Friday and Saturday with our Thanksgiving th uh, event. Me, Philip, Bill Robertson, you know, out there, I'm learning how to smoke, use the smoker and, 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 and Philip's, doing a great job in, in teaching me. Um, Pam, Sophia, Angela, uh, Linda Mc, uh, McMillan in there decorating. There was so much laughter going on and taking place. It built camaraderie. And that's what Paul's talking about is be thankful for the times that we have in working together. Because man, it would be a lonely place if you didn't have anybody to work with. And you were doing ministry all on your own. You see, it creates a bond between those who work together. We ought to rejoice for our brothers and sisters in the Lord and thank the Lord for them. Because, see, without those, again, we would be doing ministry by ourselves and on our own. He also mentioned the saints. Paul was clearly thankful for Silas and Timothy, but he was also thankful for the church body. That body of believers that without them, there would be no ministry. You see, for me, I'm, saying, I'm thankful for each of you because each of you have impacted my life and my walk. You might not know it and I might not say it enough, but I truly thank God for each and every one of you, for everything that you've done for me. The support that I know that I've received and seen throughout the years, I'm sure that if I asked everybody to come up and just say something that God has done through this church, we would be here all night. And the testimonies that would be shared would be unbelievable. Now, here's some of just my own experiences. The, the food pantry with the benevolence of, of the turkey dinners for Thanksgiving. Early on, early on, when we, Sophia and I first started coming, we were in... in, in, in some financial issues, and the church called and said, I remember this, Stacy. I don't know if you do or not, but I, Stacy called me one day, and I was at work. She said, hey, the church wants to give you a turkey. And I was like, for what? They said, well, we prayed about it. We want to give you a turkey. I was like, wow, y'all don't even know me like that. But y'all want to give me a turkey. And then I think back of other things. My mom passed away in 2013. I think of my lift group who not only prayed for me here, but then we were so worried about, okay, we all got to go to Seguin and we're going to stay there for five days. That's going to get expensive. My lift group raised the money so that none of my family had to come out of pocket for those hotel rooms. My lift group and church family went to Seguin and served food, bought the food, served the food so that my family wouldn't have to come out of pocket or serve 
instead of being served. It's my walk. My pa- I think of my pastors. I think of Lyndon Ellis, who really was there with me early on. I remember one time Sophia was out for, she was away on business and I was sitting down watching TV. I had put Jordan to sleep or whatever. And, 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 and so um, I'm sitting there watching TV or whatever and I hear a knock on the door. I'm like, who is that? Who do you think it was? Lyndon Ellis. What are you doing, brother? Uh, watching TV? Well, good, I'm gonna come in and watch TV with you. Why? To make sure you're not doing anything you're not supposed to do. I think of Bill Robertson. Larry Jaquette, Phil Dutton, so many other men that have truly lifted me up and prayed for me, have called me and said, what can I do for you? I think of my marriage. When Sophia and I were separated, I think of Pastor Tim calling me out and just saying, why are you being stupid? I think of Kerry and Gary Brown, that although I never answered his phone calls, he kept on calling me, just checking on me. I think of Carol Lowry and Wanda Simons who came to our door one Sunday morning and said, why are y'all being this way? Y'all need to get dressed and get to church. I think of my boys. I praise God for Eric Jenkins, who, were the, who was the Awana commander when Jordan and Aiden went through Juanus. I think of Melanie and Rhonda, who God knew Jordan needed a Miss Rhonda um, because he was so painfully shy. He, God placed Miss Rhonda in Jordan's life for a reason. I think of Crystal Dutton. who, when Jordan moved from Awanas to youth, again, that God knew that he needed Crystal in his life. I think of Pastor Matt, who has walked with Aiden and truly done something miraculous in his life. I think of serving as pastor, I think of y'all. I think of how, if I was to write a letter to, to believe his church, it would be nothing but thank yous. It would be nothing of thank you for everything. I often go back, and so I'm gonna tell myself here a little bit. I often go back to the Sunday where Pastor Joe announced that I was coming on staff. And I just think about that. I'm like, man, that's so surreal. Like I knew what happened, but it was, it was like, wow, it's really happening and just the support that y'all have given me throughout my four or five years here. That's what the body of believers do, does. That's what Christians do is we support each other. And so that's what Paul is writing the church is thanking them for being them, for being what God has called them to be. You know, in his greeting, Paul reminds them of their position. In verse one, it says here, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians and God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul spoke of their physical location, but also of their spiritual location. He, he reminded them of who they were and where they were. They were the church in Thessalonians. We need to often be reminded of, who, of where we are. We are in Spring, Texas. We are here for a reason. We are here for a purpose. My, my, my fear is that we've forgotten of what our purpose here is to do, and that is to glorify God and to share the gospel with the community. I, I fear that many times we forget about that. We just come to church on Sunday. But this is the place. We do God's work out there. And so are you doing God's work? And so he's reminding them of where they are, their physical location. I have placed you here for a reason. And so you are at Believer's Fellowship for a reason. And are you doing God's work? Are you just occupying a chair? But then he reminded them of who they were. 
They were set apart, servants of the living God. They were in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. This reminded them of their obligation, their obligation as Christians to serve the Lord and the greater power and potential that they possessed because of him. You see, we need to be reminded of our physical and spiritual location. We are positioned where we are for a purpose and an obligation. When was the last time you shared the gospel with anybody? When was the last anybody? It was the last time you shared Jesus with somebody. We have each been called to serve the Lord in our community. And as Christians, you see, as Christians, we're not called to, to sit on the sidelines. We're not called to, to be comfortable or stagnant or complacent. We can't, we can't, these words or these, these sentences should never be echoed or said in, 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 in this place. Well, I've done my time. I've done enough. I don't have the time or my favorite. That's the pastor's job. I don't know how many of y'all have drank the coffee this morning, but that is not my job because that coffee is not good and I'll admit it. And so what are you doing for Christ? We've all heard the, the 1090 rule, right? 10% of the people doing 90% of the work. I was reading a report recently that that actually has changed. It's no longer 1090. It is 793. It's 7% of the people doing 93% of the, of the work. 7% doing 93% of the work. So where do you line up on that? Where are you with that? Unfortunately, we have become consumers instead of contributors. Let's look at the petition that, that Paul wrote. Grace to you and peace. Paul offered a prayer of blessing for grace and peace unto them. He desired the Lord's grace in their life. You see, grace is, is a blessing that is given to somebody that doesn't deserve it. Simply put, grace is unmerited favor. That word, that word grace translated in, in Greek is charis. And charis, it, it, that, that definition, the English word does not do justice to the Greek word charis. Because what charis means in the Greek, it means that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm. It means the having favor of the merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon souls leads us to Christ. That's what grace is. Grace keeps us. It strengthens us. It increases us in the Christian faith, knowledge, and affection. It is the extension of his holy influence upon our lives. Paul desired this grace for them. It is the same thing that God desires for us. It's essential considering the opposition that we face each day. Just as they faced opposition then when Paul wrote the letter, we faced that same opposition. You see, Paul wanted them to enjoy harmony, security, prosperity, and an absolute assurance to the faith. And we can only have that. We can only have those elements when we're in God's will. That's where we experience and are able to lead a productive spiritual life. You see, it's God's grace that sustains us, and it's his peace that's, that, that, that secures us. Let's go to verse 2 here. In verse 2, it says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers. Paul encouraged them by letting them know that he was praying for them. I don't know about you, but it is encouraging for me to know that I got brothers and sisters in the Lord that are praying for me. That, they, that I get texts, there's random texts throughout the day that say, brother, I'm praying for you. And you know that it's not so random when you think about it. It is typically right when the time where I'm struggling with something, I get a text from somebody saying, hey, God put you on my heart, no, I'm praying for you. So uh, although we consider it random, it's really not. It's by design. So when you get those emails from our prayer line, 
pray for them. Just don't glance over them, but pray for them. And then let them know that you're praying for them. When you have the honor and the privilege of somebody coming to you and saying, hey, will you pray for me? Take it as that. Take it as an honor and a privilege. Don't think of, I don't have time. Stop what you're doing because it's not that important. Nothing is more important than, than being with somebody and being able to pray with them. Know that our, our Sunday morning prayer team has pr prayed for each and every one of you this morning. We lifted you up, some by name, because some of y'all are struggling. And so we're praying for you. Place people's names or situations on our prayer wall so that we could pray for you. Go to your personal prayer closet and pray for them. Because one thing, and I've said it before, and I'll, and I'll say it again, they need the prayer, and we need the practice. We should always be praying for people. Always be praying. Let's break this verse down a little bit. The first thing is the premise. He revealed that he gave, he gave thanks to God for them. He was actively praying for the people and the church and the believers of Thessalonica and the work that they were doing. He wasn't just praying for them. He was praying for the work that they were doing. They were the focus and the heart of his prayer. He knew that they needed help from God. He knew that they could not do it alone. And what's, 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 what's great is that they knew that they could not do the work that God has called them to do without God. I believe that we can all agree that we need to be reminded of the urgent need to pray. that we all need the Lord's help and to seek him when we need help. We should pray earnestly for the church, the body, and everyone that makes it up. We need to pray for one another, thanking the Lord for those that we serve with. Second thing is the prayer. Paul literally made mention of them when he prayed. It wasn't just a generic prayer. So many times we get in a hurry and we're just like, oh, pray for, pray for you know, Bob. Lord, you know. And then we move on. Yes, the Lord knows, but specifically say what you're praying for. Now, some things we won't know because sometimes it's, you know, hey, I need prayer, it, you know, it, 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 you know and, and so we leave it at that. But then we say specifically, Lord, you know what's going on with Bob. And I lift him up and I stand with my brother in Christ. We either pray generically or in haste or we don't pray at all or we, we do this. I'll pray for him later. And then we don't, there's no later, because later never happens. We need to make it a practice of when somebody asks us to pray that we stop and pray. I don't care if you're at Walmart. I don't care if you're at work. I don't care. Wherever you are, you need to stop and pray. If God puts somebody on your heart, that's for a reason and a purpose. Pray for them. You see, he knew them personally. He knew the struggles and needs that they faced individually. Now, some of y'all might think, but yeah, but nobody prays for me. Do you let anybody know? Now, there's some things that I, I as, as, as a, the campus pastor, I don't know about. And it's not because I want to, because I want to know what to pray for each one of y'all. But I can guarantee you, anybody, that, that everybody in here has somebody and someone that they can call and they can pray with them, Right? So the only reason you don't have somebody to pray for or pray with is because you aren't putting yourself out there. You're not getting involved with lift. You're not making connections and friendships here. And so we all can be, we all know somebody and we all have, can have a connection with somebody that we could be praying for. We, but now we can do better about praying for specific needs again. And so when there's a general desire for prayer, pray for them and pray for that need. There are brothers that I'm praying for right now. I, I, I heard this from one of the, one of the people here uh, a while back. He says he has a list and he has a list in his prayer closet wherever he prays. And he goes down that list of prayers every day and he will keep that person or those people on that list until there's closure or there's an answer or, or they're taken off the list because God has moved in that prayer. But they stay on that list until they're done. I was like, that's great. 
That's what we each should be doing is praying for those people and continuously praying for those people. So we need to make it a priority and earnestly pray for their need. The second thing is, is persistence. And there's a word in there, and if you read it through, if you read it too fast, you miss it. And it's that word always. It's that he didn't say, I prayed for you once, I prayed for you sometimes, or I often pray for you. He says, I always pray for you. Always pray for you. He mentioned them every time he prayed. Now, if we're truly being honest, many of us do not always pray. And sometimes our prayer is our last resort. You see, my prayer is that we each develop a sense of urgency and a commitment to pray. And when we pray, we make it a priority to mention those prayers and those petitions specifically. So when Paul concluded this, his letter here, his greeting, he mentioned the faithful and enduring attributes of the church. And as I was reading this, I truly am thankful for the faithful members of Believer's Fellowship. The love that you have each shared for me and for each other. Let's go to verse 3 here. Verse 3 talks about constantly bearing in mind your work of faith, uh, labor of love, and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. You see, faith is a person's response to the word of God. When a person responds to the word of God, then they walk by faith. You see, the, the church there had embraced Jesus as the Christ. They were unshaken in their commitment of him. Even though they had enemies and even though they had distractors, even though there, there was so much animosity and opposition towards them and the church, they remained steadfast in their faith, in their commitment of, of the work of God. The church refused to abandon what God had put them there to do. Often, how many of y'all... I get this all the time on my phone sometimes when, I, when I'm checking out apps on my, like different apps on my phone, I'll usually get like a, like a survey. Hey, rate this app, right? How are we doing? Y'all get that sometimes when you have your phone, uh, certain apps open? I thought about doing that for the church, like first time visitors send in some something and say, hey, rate us. How do we do? How was your experience? Um, but that's right. Sometimes like, ooh, maybe I don't want their response, right? Like maybe, you know, especially if they're like, ah, this is wrong or that is wrong. It's good to know. But I always often thought about, you know, what would it be like if, if, if people rated us and what the feedback would be, what we would be getting? You know, how was your most recent visit? If someone who knew about Believer's Fellowship truly knew us and took the time to reflect about what they remembered as their experience at Believers and, and the people and, and the members here, what would they have to say about us? Could, they, could it be said that we were committed to the work of faith? Is the Lord and his work our priority? Are we determined to reach the world by sharing the good news? And so as members, I think we need to think, what are we doing to make them answer yes to each of those questions? What are we doing as a body of believers? Second, Paul mentioned their labor of love. Now, this is an interesting thing. This is an interesting way of, of wording this, labor of love. Because if you truly love something, why is it so laborious? Why should loving be, be considered work? Now, we don't view it that way often, but sometimes love is laborious. Sometimes love is hard work. Because there's, there's some, like I said, there's some brothers in here at, at, at Believer's Fellowship that it is hard for me to love them. But I love them because God has called me to love them. And I'm sure some of y'all are sitting like, yeah, you, Pastor. But we are called to love each other. You see, they determined to love unconditionally. This church in, in Thessalonians was not deterred by the opposition. Their love was, was not based solely upon what they received. 
They express love when it was not earned, deserved, or returned. Isn't that what love is? And that is truly what God's love looks like. He loves us like that. When we don't deserve it, we've done nothing to earn it. He loves us anyway. I believe that, that they were so moved by the love that they had received by Jesus that they were compelled to do the labor that God has called them to do regardless of the circumstances. You see, when our heart is filled with love, labor, labor is not a burden, it's a joy. Jesus tells us in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. You see, because if you don't love God, then yes, the work will be tedious. The work will be, it won't be worth it. J. Vernon McGee wrote this in his commentary about this verse. He said, if working for the Lord is a great burden to you today, I believe G the Lord Jesus would say to you, give it up, brother, don't bother with it. Because if, if loving people is hard, is difficult and laborious, then don't worry about doing it. Because God told us to love each other. You see, we are to love him, and that should characterize our lives and our church. Paul also mentioned their patience. In verse 3, he said, the steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. The hope that Paul spoke of was the blessed assurance, the blessed hope that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. It's the blessed hope of the return of his son. That's the blessed hope that that, that, that Paul was talking about to the church, that they remained steadfast in that, that they were patiently waiting for that, that there was resolve there. Their, their, their hope wasn't flippant. It was, I have hope today, I won't have hope tomorrow, or depending on circumstances, it remained steadfast. They always had hope. You see, to have that blessed hope Paul is reminding them that it's not done and it's not in vain. Their faith, love, and hope were settled. It was settled in Christ and in God the Father. They were held and secured by God's mighty hand. And, 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 and storms will come. Opposition will be constant. But God will always be there. Our hope is not founded in man. Our hope is not founded in the world. Our hope is not founded in the political party or, or, or student loan forgiveness or tax deductions or tax breaks or who's in office. Our hope is not founded in those things. Our hope is founded on the cross. Our hope is founded in faith, love, and hope. Paul wrote about faith, love, and hope also to the church in Corinthians. Y'all remember that, right? First, thir first uh, Corinthians 13, 13. But now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. This must be our foundations as believers. This must be our foundation as believers fellowship. Finally, Paul mentioned their longevity in verse four. He said, um, Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you. You see, Paul understood the adversity that the church was under, that was, the church was under at Thessalonica and, and what they faced. He was not concerned about their demise. He was not concerned uh, uh, that, that things were going to happen because he knew that they would remain. He knew that even though all these things that would fake, continually face the difficulties and the trials and the tribulations, that these were not ordinary people. These were the elect. Now, before you think pastors gone, gone reformed and, and Calvinist, that's not it. You see, that word can be, can be uh, uh, abused. That's not the elect that I'm talking about. You see, election means the act of picking out to choose. It simply means that God chose to save us by his divine grace. God chose to to provide a means of our salvation. He drew us into himself so that we might be saved. Once you come to Christ, you become the elect. 
because God has elected and chosen to give us a means to salvation. The saved will endure even though adversity continues to come against us. I'm going to ask the band to come up. You know, churches are facing today, churches are facing opposition. I truly believe that church, churches today are facing church fatigue. They're facing apostasy. They're facing false doctrine. They're facing, you know, all these things. Churches are facing complacency. Did you know that more churches are closing every year than are opening? It is harder to find pastors willing to serve in churches now than ever before because of fatigue. Pastors are getting burned out because the body of believers feel that it is the pastor's job to do everything. You see, Christians, and, and people will mock at the statement I'm going to make, but Christians are the number one persecuted and oppressed religious group in the world. Now, you might think, well, it's not that bad here in the States. Not yet, but it is. Our Christian liberties are, are, are being taken away. People are dying in the Middle East and in Asia for God's word. Many of our own families have turned away from us because they don't wanna talk about Jesus. But know that our lives are not dictated by outward circumstances, but by an inward presence of Jesus in our lives and the Holy Spirit that dwells in each and every one of us that are believers. If you are part of the church, and that's the global church, that's God's church, right? That means that being saved by God's grace, and you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are a part of the church. But now you are called to be a part of the local body of believers. Being plugged in and serving and giving of your time, talent, and treasures. When Paul wrote this letter, he thanked them for being a part of that local body of believers, for doing God's work where they, were, where they were located. Are you thankful for the church? Are you thankful for what God has done for you? Are you doing all that you can to pray for, support, and serve Believers Fellowship? You see, for me, I'm so thankful for Believers Fellowship. I'm so thankful for the man that invited me to the men's retreat where I got to just spend time at the foot of Jesus and really come to the understanding of what life was going to be like if I didn't know God, know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. For men that, that walked with me and ministered to me and discipled me, that held me accountable. Are you thankful for that? Are you still thinking, I don't have anybody like that? This morning, I pray that God will continue to provide us with opportunities to show our love and dedication to the church, and to his church, and to the community at large. So the invitation is simple. I'd ask that you stand. I'm gonna have, ask uh, Mike Miller to come stand over here. I'm gonna ask Pastor Matt to stand over here. And so I'm asking you to stand and it's simple. The question is, do you know Christ? Do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior? Have you given him everything? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Have you repented of your sins? Have you asked him to come into your life? If not, today's your chance. Today's your opportunity. He has chosen you, but now it's your choice to choose him. When Paul wrote this letter, he was writing to the believers at Thessalonians because of the work they've done.
Take this time to ask God what God wants you to do. The work that he has placed on your heart. If God has put a person on your heart to pray for, come to one of these gentlemen, come to the altar, pray for them, lift them up. There are a lot of people not here today because they're struggling, they're hurting, they're sick. Pray for them. As the band plays, come and spend time with the Father. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you right now, Father. We thank you for your grace and your mercy that is new every day, Father. Father, I thank you. Father, on that day in 2004, Father, where I gave my life to the Lord, Father, I thank you that you've made a way for each of us to know you, Father, through your son, Jesus Christ, Father. Father, I thank you for this church and this body of believers, Father, that have ministered to so many, Father. And I pray that we do not become complacent in that, Father. We do not rest on what we've done, Father, but continue to strive to do more as you called us to do more, Father. So, Father, I pray for those that don't know you, Father. Father, I pray that right now, Father, that you just pierce their heart, Father, that you do a work in them, Father, that you let them see, Father, their life right now is the best they'll ever have it, Father. Because without you, Father, we are all destined to spend eternity in hell, Father. And it's only because of your grace and your mercy that you sent your son down to die for us as us, Father, to pay our sin debt, Father. Father, I pray for those that are sick and, and ill right now, Father. We lift them up to you, Father. And as the band plays, we thank you, and we just want to sing your praises, Father. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Come. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. 
never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. Amen. You can have a seat. That is who he is. Amen. Amen. He never stops working. I want to thank y'all for allowing me to share my heart and, and, and know that each and every one of y'all is special to me and my family. And I know I say it every uh, month on the newsletter, um, but I can't stress it enough that I am truly blessed to, to be here for this season at Believer's Fellowship and, and to, to walk and to serve and to minister alongside some of the best people on earth. And, and I thank God for you daily uh, for all that you've done for me and my family. Amen? Amen. Uh, with that, <laughs> oh, no. I'm, I'm the least of these, brother. I'm the least of these. Um, uh, he did such a great job last week and such a blessing to me. I'm going to have Aiden come up and, and give the closing announcements. Stay connected with us on Facebook, YouTube, and at bfchurch.com. For our in-person guests, if you could take a moment and please fill out the guest card that is right in the seat back in front of you. And uh, we'll make sure to meet you after the service. And for our online viewers, you can go to bfchurch.com and click on the guest tab in the menu. And fill out the, there's a little information thing online that you can fill out and put any prayer requests that you have so we can also meet you online too. Uh, for tithes and offerings, there are three ways to give. You can drop off a check today in the offering receptacles in the back by the doors. You can do it online on the uh, go to the Give tab and write a note on what you are giving for if it is a, like a mission trip or just your tithes. And then you can come in, come in any time during the week, Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and drop off your check then. Uh, the Christmas offering, this year we're offering fun. The Christmas offering funds special mission projects we do every year. You can use the regular offering envelopes for these Christmas gifts. There are some blank lines that you can fill in the amount that you want to give. Just put on that line Christmas or missions and the amount you are giving. Uh, with that being said, you are dismissed. <laughs>